Welcome from Las Vegas, Nevada, the host city of NAB 2014. We're here on the 45th floor of the Trump International Hotel. This is Cinema 5D on the couch. Presented by b &H, the professional's source. Vitech Videocom, Tools on Air, and Zeiss. Welcome to episode 3 of Cinema 5D on the couch. Today we're here with one of our dear sponsors, Zeiss. Um, this is Michael Schielen. Uh, he's the sales director of the camera lens division. This is uh, Dr. Aurelian Dodok. He's Zeiss's principal scientist of the lens division. And this is Barry Anderson. He's a well-known filmmaker and author of the DSLR Filmmaker's Handbook. To start this off, um, let's talk a little bit about Zeiss in general. Um, what kind of company is it and how did you get back into the game of making cinema lenses? Carl Zeiss is a, is a Germany-based uh, optical company specialized in optics. Uh, so um, the company was um, founded 1846 in, in Jena. And today the headquarters are based in Oberkochen, which is uh, in the western part of Germany, close to Stuttgart. Um, the camera lens division uh, in which we are in um, is uh, specialized, obviously, in the camera lenses and also um, uh, still and motion picture lenses. The first lenses uh, were developed uh, in the beginning of the 19th century. Um, we have um, started with uh, Ultra Primes again in uh, 1999, followed by the Master Prime line in 2005. And uh, in 2010, we developed a new line of compact prime lenses. So I guess it's a quite small division within this big company. Yeah. But yeah. a very popular one, I guess. I mean, the yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, it's, it's true. It's a very small division. Um, compared to uh, huge divisions like a semiconductor industry mm. a market uh, or a medical instruments, um, instruments for um, um, industrial measure, measurement uh, tools. Um, but uh, obviously the, the branding um, part of our division, uh, the brand awareness through our lenses is very high. Mm -hmm. What about the, the CP2s? I mean, I think with those you managed to have a huge success over the past few years. I mean, they were, I think, the first uh, cinema lenses to be marketed to, and also the price range-wise, to, to DSLR filmmakers stepping up yeah. and getting more professional, you know, to trying to get a more cinematic look and a professional cinema workflow for an affordable price. Um, when did you introduce them and, and, and how did they, were they accepted by the market? I mean, it all started with uh, the launch of the Canon 5D Mark II and, uh, and let's say, a new trend of uh, HD SLR. And in the beginning, the, the filmmakers, they, they used um, traditional um, still picture uh, lenses and they recognized pretty, pretty early that uh, there is a huge um, drawback, I mean, disadvantage in using autofocus lenses on this, on this camera. So what we did, we used um, our still picture lenses and we, we developed this new line of compact prime lenses in, in 2010, which means we added a Cinestar housing with um, you know, um, Cinestar ergonomics, very precise focusing uh, through a 300 degree focus rotation. We have uh, standard dimensions so the filmmaker can uh, swap the lenses quickly on the set. Um, if you have, uh, if if you rigged it up, uh, we have manual aperture control, uh, many different, uh, many additional um, benefits for the user compared to to still picture lenses. Mm -hmm. But they use the same interiors as the as the. Right, we use the same interiors. Mm -hmm. um, this is also uh, one one parameter or one um, fact that we were able to produce these lenses for relatively, uh, or let's say economic way so we have an affordable solution and um, the best advantage actually is that these lenses can have a high flexibility so our customers can swap the mount it's not an adapter we're talking about the real mount from PL to EF, F, Micro Four Thirds or even E mount mm -hmm. for Sony cameras. 
That makes them also very versatile for rent layer. Right, right yeah. exactly. So um, we uh, so we think 50% um, of these lenses which we have sold in the last uh, four and a half years um, goes into rental mm. houses and 50% to owner operators. Yeah, that's good because you don't want to be locked into the camera system when you buy lenses. I mean, because right. I always say I, when people ask me to buy lens, uh, you know, to, for recommendation for lenses. Uh, you know, many people made the mistake and bought the, f the stills lenses in the beginning and they are now locked into one system depending on the manufacturer uh, and they can't really change their camera system easily right. even though, you know, they may want to. And, and yeah, we still have these uh, still picture lenses, yeah. ZE and ZF2 mount for, for Canon and Nikon cameras and they are still a very good option for younger filmmakers mm -hmm. who cannot afford uh, a CP2 lens yet. Um, but as you said, it's also a way to step up yeah. to next level and um, thanks to this uh, f full frame coverage, so 24 by 36 millimeter format, um, they are really a future proof solution. If you think mm. of uh, the Sony announcement uh, these days at NAB here in Las Vegas, um, Sony announced a four, how is it called, A7S, A7S camera. Yes, yeah full frame camera, um, there are not so many lenses, yeah. cine style lenses, which can cover um, this sensor. Yeah. yeah, they are an investment, they stay with you for your entire career, right. whereas the camera will be swapped within yeah. a few years because it's obsolete, right? True. Yeah. 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 So the, where do you actually manufacture the CP2s and the, the new compact zooms as well? Yeah, all the cine style lenses are manufactured in Germany, in, in Oberkochen, in a small village. Um, again, close and to everybody to works for size there, I guess. Everybody works for <laughs> size there. We have six thousand inhabitants and uh, yeah. basically six thousand people working okay. for size in this village. <laughs> Even the children, and everyone. Like yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, you have these new um, compact zooms. Can you tell us a little bit of that, about them? What's special about them? Do they also cover the? Is it also full frame? I think. Yes, they cover. And yeah, and 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 who do you think are, is the uh, the target group for these lenses? Okay, other than the compact primes, these lenses are not coming from a still picture lens. These, these lenses are a complete new design, um, op optically and mechanically. So um, our target is, first of all, to give our customers of the CP2 lens line um, uh, the possibility to work with zooms, a real cine style zoom. And um, secondly, it's also, um, it's also an option for all other customers we have in, you know, coming from the master prime and ultra prime um, motion picture, high-end motion picture, um, to use zooms in their work. So we think it's it's a good lens line to use uh, for <coughs> features, for ENG style um, applications, 4K sports, whenever you need. Um, a fast solution where you don't have the time to uh, add money uh, to swap uh, a lot of prime lenses. Okay. And yeah, the advantage also of this lens line is um, compared to others in the market, it covers the full frame, again, full frame sensor, mm. 24 by 36 millimeter. So it, this is actually a unique feature we have uh, compared to any other zoom manufacturer in the market. And compared to the, to this, to the still zooms, what do you think are the advantages? Um, Apart from the focus throw and that kind of stuff? Yeah, I think the main advantage is, um, is that in motion picture, um, compared to still picture, a picture should not breathe. I mean, um, this is one, one uh, big advantage. So when you um, change the, the angle of view, the, the picture, the... Um, the we sorry, the I'm mixing it up. Focus, yeah. The, the, yeah it's, on the one hand side, we have a zoom shift issue with uh, still picture lenses. So um, if you focus um, to a certain person or, you, or objective, um, this focus point should stay uh, where, where it was placed when you change the angle of view, when you zoom in and out. So yeah, with, with some, even with some stills lenses you see when you change the focus, yeah. like I mean prime lenses for stills cameras, yeah. uh, because they are made for stills, yeah. it doesn't matter that the the angle changes a little bit when you focus, but that is not acceptable for for in video work, right? Because right. you don't want to. You even see it sometimes in feature films, and I always wonder why they don't correct it. Mm. To be mm. honest, yeah. And breathing is the other uh, topic. Yeah. So when you when you um, focus 
when you change the focus, the picture should not uh, breathe. Mm -hmm. I mean, it should stay um, as it is and not bring into the picture new elements yeah. which the, the filmmaker doesn't want to, to show. Yeah. Yeah. Aurelian, we, we, uh, you are the chief scientist, so you know everything about all these lenses. Um, we you know, are all creative people, we don't know the technical stuff behind it, but we just use it and we say that it's either good or bad and <laughs> are happy with it or we're not. Um, <clears throat> the bouquet is something which is very important to us filmmakers. Uh, we always are after something like the filmic look and uh, you know, creamy, um, out of focus highlights and stuff like that. Zeiss like, is very famous for the a special bouquet, you can see that a a lens is more cinematic when it looks a certain way, there are different ways, but you can, you can see the difference. What, what influences Bouquet and, and how, can you, how, can you develop, how can, can you develop this? So, um, we, we have to, to make some, some uh, um, separations here in the, in the lens uh, landscape. Uh, the most lenses we have, and uh, we are talking up now about the uh, um, zooms about the com compact zooms and the compact primes. These lenses are uh, made in such a way to have a, a, neutral, a neutral image. So you cannot, uh, it, it, it was our goal uh, to make uh, an, an, an image almost, almost uh, perfect. Uh, so not to have, not to have uh, special, special uh, 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 features in the image uh, making the image uh, to be uh, to have some kind of look, we w we make this we made this lens is having a certain personality, so that the artist has the uh, the uh, the freedom to style the image as he wanted. Uh, this was the goal with this compact primes and compact zooms, uh, so to make a perfect image with a high resolution and a very good contrast, neutral in, in colors, so to be very, to make the picture as, to make the picture as the object is. Mm -hmm. So uh, size is always about having a very neutral image, but as sharp as possible? Uh, is that as sharp as possible. Uh, uh, we are we're using this philosophy with our compact primes and uh, the master primes or the ultra primes. It's something very different with the master anamorphic. With the master anamorphic, we have uh, uh, had the goal to make a lens with a very special, with a very special background, with a very very special. But I think we are going to talk about this issue. We're going later to talk on. about the anamorphic okay, later, okay. yeah, yeah. later on. Yeah. So the um, yeah, as we said, it's a very the size lenses are, are are known for very high sharpness oh. and a neutral look, and I think also some other manufacturers. You know, you can recognize them more easily, maybe, because they built in the look into the lenses, I think. But size is a different philosophy. Yes, we, we want to make a lens uh, with a very good image. Mm -hmm. As I said, uh, the, the, we uh, want to give the, the, the artist the chance to, to change this image uh, after his wishes. If you have a perfect image, you can change it. You can make it as you wish. If you had a bad image, we will, you will never get a good image because uh, information is missing from the object. So if it's you comparable to cameras where we have, uh, you know, very like, like S-log from the Sony cameras, which is as neutral as possible, so you can add everything in post as you want. Yes. But if you shoot with a picture profile, you're like set. It might look good on the surface, but you can't change it anymore. Yes, you yeah. can change it anymore and you, can, yet you cannot improve it. You need very special techniques to, to try to improve, uh, to improve uh, contrast or resolution, but you do not have any more information from the object, so everything is only calculated. It's not from the object. All the size uh, compact primes and also the compact zooms have a very large image circle that they cover. So they all yeah. cover a full frame stills yeah. camera, which is also popular, became popular in the video world with the 5D Mark II. Yeah. Are there any disadvantages that you, you know, or um, do that? Because many other manufacturers, they focus on the super 35 millimeter image circle. So it was our intention from the very beginning to make the lenses, this compact, uh, uh, this compact prime series, to make it, 
to make them uh, covering the full frame. Uh, and uh, on the same time, not to be larger than the similar zooms covering the uh, uh, academy format. Uh, and uh, uh, we have done this uh, with a lot of innovation. With a lot of innovation, we have a very robust design and very, very compact in size. If, if, you, if you compare it with a the, with the similar from the, our main competitors, you will see we have quite, quite similar sizes there but covering a full frame format and this is 1.5 uh, uh, more uh, radius uh, image radius or two times more uh, two times more uh, uh, surface image surface we have to cover and when you use one of the compact primes or compact zooms on the super 35 millimeter yeah. uh, sensor that probably also means you don't have as much distortion at the at the, at the borders because the the image circle is bigger right the image circle is bigger, so you are using the core, the core surface of image, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, there the image is uh, very, very, very good. So it is the, the, co the core, the core surface of the of the image. Uh, it's quite smaller. The uh, Super 35 uh, millimeter format is quite smaller. So we use only this central area from uh, from the capability of the lens, and uh, you will get uh, a very, very good image. Yeah. We also call it the filet or sweet spot effect. Um, so when you yeah. just uh, it's the very best the very, very best, best uh, part of the image yeah. best part of the image yeah. but mm. I think it's it's not all only the sensor size if you look at, at the, the trends in the camera market um, yes there are cameras with um, a larger sensor size like the Canon 1DC uh, Mark III um, or the Nikon D800 but there are also cameras like uh, the Sony uh, F65 they use a smaller, or the S35 uh, millimeter, super 35 millimeter sensor format, but they use smaller pixel sizes. So more pixels, a higher pixel density. And I think also for this, correct me if I'm wrong, but for, this, uh, for these cameras, we need lenses which can resolve these small pixels. Yeah, and right. and um, I think this, this is also one approach we take with these uh, compact prime and zoom lenses. You also have a new, I mean, this is not a cinema lens, but you also have a new 55 millimeter lens, which is super sharp, especially yeah. made for the D800, right? Right. It's um, actually, it's not really made for the D800. Um, three years ago, when we started to think about this lens, we had the idea to come up with a non-compromised lens, with, with a lens which uh, does not have any um, image uh, errors, I would say. So no chromatic aberration, no distortion, no color fringes, or everything you know from an image which is not perfect. So we wanted to have a perfect image and we wanted to use this lens also as a brand shaper. But uh, the, the feedback, the response from the market is incredible. So now you, I guess uh, you have a lot of filmmakers wanting this lens, right? Also, yes. <laughs> uh, there are people asking uh, for this lens. Also yesterday at the show, um, people were coming to the booth and asking uh, when they can expect a Cinestar lens of yeah. the Otus lens. So um, the, the feedback is great. We're happy the lens has exceeded our expectations for this, mm -hmm. uh, for this year. And, and we are expanding this, this lens range. So there will be an 85 millimeter lens. And are you thinking about so the cinema style version of it? Um, I mean, uh, never say never, but so far today we have so many projects in line. Yeah. Um, I, I couldn't tell you a date for, okay. for such a project. <laughs> so. so Barry, you are an experienced filmmaker and you know a lot of the DSLR landscape from the very beginning as well. Uh, do you think there is a, a typical Zeiss look? Because you're quite experienced with Zeiss lenses, or I, w I would have to say I would agree that when I've chosen, you know, the CB2s or the the ZF uh, versions, I like them because of the fact that, you know, I have a lot of vintage lenses. So I use them to kind of burn in, in a unique look to it. But on a lot of projects, I want what we'd call like a blank canvas. I want I want white. And I can paint everything on there I want. And Zeiss is, you know, they give me such a good looking image that allows me to kind of, you know, light and create and art direct within the frame and let that stand on its own. So I don't, I don't, I don't notice a look of Zeiss per se, but what I do notice is a lot of times when I see projects that I'm in love with, it turns out that they were shot on Zeiss. Mm. So I'd say that's probably more, a more accurate representation than a given look. What's your favorite, favorite lens? 
in which line? <laughs> <laughs> the that's a good one. I would say I'm in love from the still line. I love the 15 millimeter. Um, I like shooting wide angle, and most wide angles I work with have a lot of distortion. But mm -hmm. at six feet, you have straight lines, super sharp image. It's beautiful. Um, I also think that uh, from the CP2s, it's hard to to decide between the super speeds, yeah. but I, I really love the, the 135. I like, you know, compressing things a little bit and having, you know, having an image really pull out what I want to show and let everything kind of drop off in the background, so. Yeah, I'm, to me it's the 85. It's I'm, the perfect portrait I'm lens. I'm typical, you know, give me 12 lenses, I'll give you reasons why I like them all. <laughs> <laughs> so what kind of stuff do you shoot, mostly? I don't think there is a mostly. I've literally done, done everything, uh, feature films, you know, commercials, music videos, corporate stuff. Um, I think my specialty, uh, from a directing standpoint, I like working with talent. So coaching talent, delivering talent, but when it comes to the creative side on the cinematography, I think, you know, right now, the whole landscape's littered with, you know, everybody can have a camera and they can go shoot. And what I'm finding out is giving me a lot of phone calls of like, geez, we shot that last time, but it didn't look so good, but what you shoot's really good, why is that? And, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with it that, you know, the common thing is, oh, these cameras are so fast, lenses are so fast that yeah. we don't need the light anymore. True. <laughs> well, then, then I love hearing that because I'm like, good, I'm getting a phone call next week. So, you know, a lot of the tried and true filmmaking techniques that I learned shooting 35 millimeter film, suddenly I'm like, well, these didn't go away. They're still here. Yeah. Um, and just applying that now to, I don't care what camera, I don't care any of that because all it's going to take is a good lens, a good sensor and some good lighting and, you know, well, that's not all. I mean, it's it's a lot that it takes, you know, in, in total. But oh, yeah. a lot of people starting out think, you know, you just need the newest, be best camera. Yep. And especially at this NEB, we see a craziness about new cameras. <laughs> Everybody and their mom is releasing a new camera. Yep. And, uh, you know, people don't realize that it takes much more to make a good film. Well, I, when, I, when I, you know, have training or talk to people, it's, you know, cameras usually drive all the discussion. And I usually try to kind of push that down, saying a camera is a tool that's very replaceable, like you said earlier. You know, if you're going to spend money on a camera package, I usually tell people about 60% of your budget should go into lenses. Because yeah. if you buy good quality lenses, those will stay with you years and years and years beyond whatever camera system. But it's kind of like people have to keep thinking about it. What do I need in a package to shoot? What sort of lights? What sort of lenses? What sort of camera? What sort of support? And build something and appropriately think about it because I think a lot of people stretch for like the best newest camera and they have no money left over for these other things. So they go, well, I bought a fast lens. Exactly. I have the newest cameras and it'll look great. I usually tell people to buy a cheap camera and a good yes. lens. Yes, absolutely. Because I, when somebody asks me, um, you know, I have 2,000 euros budget yep. for a new camera and a lens. Yep. And then they ask me, should I buy, you know, the 5D Mark II and add the kit lens? Yes. <laughs> it's like, no. Yeah. <laughs> you should probably buy the, I don't know, 650D. Yes. And buy a ZF lens, you know, a CF lens. And, and that, this is and a much a better good. choice because it stays with you forever. Yeah. And the camera, no matter which camera it is, it's obsolete in two years. Correct. And I would, I would add to that, if people are out there on the show floor or whatnot, whenever you buy a camera, if it comes with a kit lens, don't buy it because that is just throwing money down the tube. I mean, you'll use it briefly and you'll realize the limitations. The reason they sell you a kit lens is for beginning still photographers. It is not for video, it's not for a filmmaker. Those will not go beyond a few weeks to a month's worth of your time, so do not buy a kit lens. Buy a camera, then pick a lens that you want to use that's going to last for you. I always say it's like buying a Ferrari with, you know, like a Mazda motor or something. <laughs> it's, it doesn't make sense. It might look nice yes. on the surface, but the result is not what you expect. Yeah. So it, it, it just doesn't add up. And it, it's the heart of the image. I mean, you get everything that goes onto the, onto the sensor that's recorded goes through the lens. So yes. it's essential to have a, a good quality there, right? And especially with 4K, we have this 4K craziness. I think every camera released at NEB is 4K. So we have loads of people now jumping onto these cameras and buying it with a cheap lens again, uh, yes. just to, you know, because they need a 4K camera, but they don't realize that you very often, cheap lenses can't even resolve yeah. 4K. So how do you measure uh, 4K lenses? How does, it, how does it work? Do you actually look at the image, uh, you know, in a, through a camera and analyze it w when you develop a lens or how does it work? Let, let, let me start, start a little bit with 4K. What's 4K? It's a, 
I think this is a very important question, uh, and uh, uh, I want to say some words about it, and then uh, come back to your uh, question. Um, you have we, we have talked about camera and lenses, and what camera we should uh, we, we should buy and what lens we should buy. Uh, you have to always to think what is limiting performance. This is the main question. What is limiting the performance? If the camera is 4K ready, that means that your sensor, your sensor has a, 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 a pixel resolution in the horizontal, uh, uh, 4,096 4, uh, pixels, and in the vertical, 2,024, uh, 48, sorry, 2,048 pixels in the vertical, uh, then the, the camera should be, should be uh, 4K ready. Uh, but uh, now the question is, what is limiting? What is limiting performance? Uh, and it uh, can be the camera or it can be the lens. Our lenses, compact lenses, are all 4K ready. That means we are, uh, th they are, uh, there is a capability to resolve all information for the, uh, uh, for the sensor covering this uh, 4,000 uh, times uh, 2,000 pixels. And uh, 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 of course, if you have lenses uh, uh, to, with such a quality, you have to measure it somehow. And uh, uh, we are talking, when you are talking about 4K and resolution and, and things like that uh, and contrast, you have to think uh, that uh, all this world is, is, uh, uh, is uh, talking about line pairs. Uh, line pairs, what's, what's line pairs per millimeter? It sounds uh, like uh, something very small because it's per millimeter, and indeed it's very small. If you think uh, we have resolution, we call this resolution. What can we see in line pairs? Uh, and uh, uh, if uh, uh, you have a certain contrast for these line pairs, you have always, and, and uh, you can see line pairs everywhere. Everywhere you can see line pairs, uh, m mostly on textiles. You see line pairs, and the question is, can you see this? For example, yeah. I, I don't. My shirt is yes, not really yes, yes. TV ready. Yes, you, if, you, <laughs> if you see these line pairs in the image, then you can resolve these line pairs. And if you think we are talking about uh, 40 line pairs per millimeter, that means between a, a, a white and a black line, uh, there is a distance of uh, 25 microns. Uh, this is uh, 40 line pairs per millimeter. And if you get this. Uh, uh, if you get this uh, uh, line pairs resolved on the image, then you can say you can resolve 40 line pairs. And uh, uh, if you talk about 4, 4K, uh, the resolution you have to resolve is around 70, 70 line pairs per millimeter. So it's a huge resolution and uh, uh, not all lenses can resolve this uh, line per density. So uh, we can all call our lenses uh, 4K ready because they can resolve this uh, resolution of 70, around 70 line pairs per millimeter. Uh, and uh, if the camera is also 4K ready, this resolution is transferred in the, in the chain, in the image chain, uh, through the camera to the image. Um, so uh, you can measure this uh, very, very simply. Uh, we have uh, this, we have um, you have a lot of methods to, to measure line pairs per millimeter. We call it MTF modulation transfer function. It's uh, pure from the mathematical point of view. Uh, you can uh, you can uh, see this uh, resolution very simply if you have a precision a precision projector and a, a, a dia a dia uh, film with a certain with a certain um, um, a model on it with a certain picture and if you project this picture on a screen and in, you have in your object these line pairs per millimeter, these density lines, if you, and if you can see them in the projected image, you can say you can resolve it. This is the simplest test you can use. So instead of a camera, you put this uh, little image behind the lens and throw light through it, right? Yes. You so are, you don't you, use a camera? You, no, you, don't, the, uh, you can use a camera as a second method. But uh, the simplest method, and uh, uh, the simplest method is with the projector. You are using it in reverse, so you are projecting an, an, an object with this line pair so you want, you want to check on a screen. And if the lens is uh, behaving uh, 
uh, in quality, then you can see these line pairs on the screen. If you can see it, then you cannot resolve, or your eyes cannot resolve it. You can resolve the line pairs if the difference, if the contrast has a value of more than 20%. This is the difference between dark and, 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 and white mm -hmm. in the image. If this, this difference is smaller than 20%, then the eyes cannot resolve this image anymore. You, you see everything gray. It's the difference between white and dark, and if the distance is small, both colors, both, are nearing gray. So if you cannot resolve, both are gray, so you cannot see them. Mm -hmm. You cannot sep see them separate. So that's very interesting. So it's very scientific, but also, uh, yeah, you, you, it's basically like a, a projector, like anybody you know, what, what, what do you use? It's, and, and, and can you check, I mean, many of the, of the less expensive wide lenses, you, you mentioned it, uh, like 15 millimeters, uh, it's very often a problem that there's distortion at the edges. And I, I think you probably can also check the distortion because yes. the lines should stay straight, Yes, right? yes. You have a, in the, in the uh, object, this is a standard object. So you have vertical and horizontal lines, uh, also circles. Uh, you have lines in different densities. And uh, it's uh, always, uh, th there is a figure, there's a number near these line pairs. So you can see what line pairs you can see and what line pairs you cannot see. Line pairs you can resolve or line pairs your eyes cannot resolve. And then you can, uh, you can judge about the quality of the image uh, by uh, um, a visual check. And this is the most simple. Uh, uh, again, you need a a high quality project, projection, projection system. And when I say quality, I mean you have to focus your object uh, precise. This is the only condition because you have to you simulate, you have to simulate the situation from the camera where, you, where your lens is in very focus to the sensor. So you have to simulate the situation. So that means you have to adjust focus. Uh, uh, in the in, at the projection pro, uh, in the projection, so you have to to move the object to the lens uh, so that the object is, is in focus. Okay, that is is the capability your projection projection system has to have. So Barry, you're a filmmaker, and uh, I guess you've probably worked with 4K. Do you think it's a fad like 3D was, or is it is it staying? Is it is it is it here to stay? Um, I would say yes and yes. It's not a fad, it's here to stay. The question is, will it be that of a laser disc? Are we gonna just jump over that at some point? Resolution's gonna keep growing. I would say that most of my projects I'm on are still probably 50% 720, you know, most are 1080, and every project I've worked on that shot in 4K, they always down res and do post in 2K or less. So the rush to 4K is great, it's here, I tell people prepare for it and it's one of those things if you're a filmmaker, if you're buying or acquiring gear, you have to have a plan because if you buy a 4K camera, you need, your lenses need to resolve, you need to have a faster computer, you need faster hard drives, more hard drives. So it's not something that you kind of just willy nilly, hey, I got an extra couple thousand dollars, a new camera came out, let's start shooting. It's a bigger investment in that. But to me, I don't get caught up in the technology, I try to get caught up in creating images and then getting those images out to the actual end public. And there is very, very, very few outlets for people to watch 4K right now. So most people that do it, do it for fun. They buy a 4K monitor and they watch it at their house and bring over their friends. But it's not really a, a tool yet for me that I'm making money on. So I'm focusing on the things that I like creating and creating those for clients or for myself that I'm enjoying. So 4K is here, it's gonna stay but it's not by any means a standard, and I don't know if by the time everything catches up, if we will actually leapfrog 4K. I made a joke yesterday, I'm like, well, everybody's got a 4K camera, so who's gonna be the first that comes out with a 16K camera? You know, we've heard 8K, it's just gonna be a race now, like the pixel, pixel uh, uh, density on, on uh, sensors were a few years ago. So apart from the Compact Primes, Compact Zooms, you have a new special project, I would say, which is more kind of a niche, but became popular over the past few years. Mm. Uh, it's the anamorphics. Um, we all, I think, the, the filmmaking world was exposed to a lot of anamorphic hype with J.J. Abrams' lens flares, I guess. You know, the lens flares that he uses in all his films 
too, you know, he exaggerates it a bit, in my opinion. So I think there's a little bit of a misconception of what anamorphics are and what they should look like. Um, I don't know, Michael, do you want to say something about and explain to our audience what anamorphics actually are? What is the, the advantage of using an anamorphic? Why would you use it as opposed to a normal lens? Um, I think I'm not the right guy to explain that. I, from, a, from a sales point of view, um, I think it's a, it's a new trend. Um, again, a trend which is uh, coming, coming back, I would say. It's um, replaced the 3D trend also. Um, if you look at, at the NABs of, of the past years, um, 3D was, was the hype on, on every single booth. And uh, the industry uh, was somehow going towards uh, 3D. But now um, we can see a trend uh, to a new look, to this anamorphic look. And um, I think uh, we've been able to um, develop a very high performing uh, lens line. And uh, we, we show the seventh lens already here at NAB in Las Vegas. So we, we have a seven lens set ready for the market. Um, and, but the technical explanation I would yeah, hand over to the specialist who actually developed the lenses. Yeah. So. so what is an anamorphic then? So Why would you use it? <laughs> so, uh, uh, let me tell you a little bit history. I, I saw my first anamorphic film in the 70s as a child. I was fascinated. You, uh, you uh, have to wear these glasses, these special glasses, uh, also at that time. And I was very fascinating. And at that time, I didn't understand why, why, why do you need anamorphic. Now we have a larger view about this issue. Uh, and at that time, uh, uh, people wanted to see a, a wide screen, wanted to have a wide screen cinema. And uh, 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 for, for, the, uh, for this wide screen, you need a wide, uh, a wide, a wide uh, uh, film, a wide format. And uh, 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 in the early 20s, uh, some, some uh, scientists uh, uh, came up with a very good idea. Uh, why not save, to save film, in order to save film, to compress the image? To compress the image, so to use the same format, but with a larger uh, object field, with a larger field of view, and compress the image. And in the, in the, in the cinema, just decompress it. Just de-squeeze it uh, by the same factor so that you have this, the original image but large. So just to explain, that means if you wouldn't use anamorphics to get a wide image, you yeah. would have to have really big black bars printed on film, like as you used to and now recorded on the sensor. Um, but an anamorphic just still records like a, a stretched image yeah. and then it's recompressed when projected in the cinema, you are right. So you have a higher vertical resolution. I'd, I'll add one thing to that: you're also keeping the resolution the same. So if you're going to crop, you know, take a regular 24 by 36 millimeter sensor and crop it off, you're losing the resolution. Where an anamorphic yeah. lens pushes all in there, so when it's destretched, you have the full resolution of that sensor and not throwing away data, which is critical in today's time. It, it was, it was uh, from the very beginning our, our goal to make a new, a new class of anamorphic lenses. You have, you have a lot of anamorphic lenses on market today and uh, also old ones and new ones, uh, but uh, we, we thought we have to do something very different. And uh, as I said in the very beginning, uh, our philosophy was and is still to have uh, lenses with very, very good image uh, properties. Uh, uh, this was, uh, for the anamorphics, we have, we, we have changed this philosophy. We have, uh, we have uh, a, new, a new goal to have a lens with a, with a very special bouquet. We call it bouquet, and what's bouquet? It's, uh, bouquet is very simple to explain, uh, but it's hard to create. Bouquet is how, how objects which are not in focus are uh, 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 are seen uh, on image. So w w all objects which are not in focus, what, what's uh, their appearance in image? And uh, this w it was our goal to make this anamorphics very special with this feature. To have a very, very special, uh, I don't want to call it look, because look is something 
some companies are using and it's very hard to explain how they are dealing with this look but uh, we call it it's a feature it's a it's a very unique way of uh, thinking of, of dealing with images which are not in focus you cannot make this uh, uh, this special bouquet with spherical lenses you have to have this anamorphics and you have to deal with the with the uh, uh, property of this anamorphics that you have two lenses two focal lengths in one lens you have vertically and horizontally different focal lengths by a factor of two, different by a factor of two. Uh, the focal length is shorter in the horizontal direction, so that you have a larger field of view in the horizontal direction. And uh, uh, so, uh, but the, 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 the image is, is quite, uh, uh, is quite uh, 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 quadratically. So you have to squeeze the ob the the lens is squeezing is squeezing the image in horizontal in the horizontal direction by a factor of two. Uh, so keeping uh, it on the on the same sensor, and uh, uh, because uh, you are using uh, because you are using you have to use cylindrical elements cylindrical elements uh, for uh, making these two focal lengths in one lens. Uh, you are getting very unique uh, uh, image features. Uh, for objects which are not in focus. We call this uh, phenomenon uh, 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 astigmatic image. Uh, in uh, contrast to the stigmatic image, which means we have one point image for one point object. Uh, in an astigmatic image, you have for one point object, you have two points image, which are, uh, uh, which are uh, in a certain distance one from another. Uh, and uh, uh, it's very important how to deal with these distances between these image points for the same object points. And that makes the, 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 the bouquet, the objects which are, which are not in focus, very unique. Of course, the objects which are in focus, you have one image point for one object point, it's in focus. It's very clear and very sharp. But what's not in focus is, ha has a special, a special effect on you. So, for example, I think highlights are oval. The oval highlights are uh, the oval highlights are a, a, a phenomenon which is coming with with this squeezing uh, and this squeezing of the image. Uh, it's you can recognize every anamorphic uh, uh, anamorphic film because of these highlights. But what is very important and what's the very very amazing with these lenses are the bouquets not on uh, not on night uh, night scenes on daylight. Uh, because then you can see the background and you, how, the, how the objects in focus are separated from this background. Mm -hmm. And this is very unique. On, on, the, uh, on night uh, uh, images, uh, take, take from images taken at, at night time, you see, of course, these oval, oval uh, highlights, uh, but uh, this was all because the, the rest is dark. Mm. The very, this bouquet is coming, is coming into your attention very, very hard. Uh, on daylight, when you separate, as said, the objects from which are in focus from the rest of the world. And this is unique. Check it out. But lens flares are not always horizontal, like in J.J. Uh, Abrams films, or is this...? Uh, no, I think uh, this, was, uh, this was coming... We have, we have uh, um, the, the design philosophy for this new anamorphics is to, to spread the, the cylindrical lenses through the lens. So to have to make them very compact on the first time, on the second time, uh, to have them uh, to have a very very uh, compact design and a very good image, uh, and uh, uh, not to have a lot of cylindrical lenses. We do not want to have a lot of cylindrical lenses because cylindrical lenses are not uh, rotationally symmetric and are hard to align. Uh, and uh, uh, we uh, we have uh, all technic technological. Uh, possibilities there, but uh, uh, with manufacturing errors, uh, you have to reduce your number of lenses in general and the number of cylindrical lenses. So uh, uh, these uh, horizontal lines and uh, uh, um, uh, all these uh, flares coming in, uh, you can see them, but you can you can also uh, put you you have nothing in what you don't want. If you want to have something, you can put it also in the post. Uh, and uh, uh, this makes the this, this makes uh, uh, increases your possibilities to shape your image after your wishes. Yeah. 
So, to finish this session, let's talk about one special project that you brought along, a new little thing, a new little add-on. Do you want to say something about it? Yeah, um, it's here on the table. Uh, we have a, um, a motor, um, a control, which uh, can be used on our uh, zooms. Here we brought uh, with us the 28 to 80, which is the mid-zoom. Um, we also have a 70 to 200 uh, compact zoom and uh, a new 15 to 30 which we show here uh, at NAB in Las Vegas. Um, the thing is that uh, it's becoming more and more popular to uh, use um, motorized control with zooms. And uh, we're showing this uh, concept study here at the show to get feedback from our customers. Um, first of all, we, if we offer the right features with this tool and, and also to get an understanding uh, what we should uh, add, for instance. The, the big advantage is um, you can use this control not only on one lens, it's not fixed on one lens. You can uh, invest in one motor and use it on all three zooms. You just de-click um, this, this tool over here and then you, you um, can use the motor on the okay, three cool. lenses. So it's perfect for TV applications broadcast because right. we see more. I, I do more and more work for TV with, I mean, I, I only shoot on Super 35 for full frame cameras, I mean 99%, and, and when TV channels call me up, they usually want me to shoot on bigger sensor cameras, but what's really missing is a zoom rocker very often, especially for documentary purposes, it's just useful. I mean, not that I want to change, you know, the. I don't want to zoom while I'm yeah. shooting, I yeah. just don't like the style, but it still, uh, it saves you time and it, it makes everything more efficient if you have a zoom rocker on your lens. Yeah, so. and, and you cannot only, um, you know, change the zoom, but also the iris, and we have an optional, um, an option for uh, changing the focus. So nice. mm -hmm. um, you can use uh, this this um, equipment uh, also on a crane. So when mm, you perfect. don't touch the lens, so you don't need a, a remote follow focus anymore. Uh, right. Exactly. Um, so I think it's a very versatile and, and flexible solution, mm -hmm. um, and I think we're confident to to, to develop uh, this this concept study okay. in the end. Great. So where can people find you if they are at NAB? Our customers can find us uh, at NAB in the Central Hall at uh, booth number 9042. Okay, so it's hard to, to miss, I think. Hard to miss. Uh, you can uh, you can look for the the blue logo on the white ground. So should be possible okay. to find, yeah. So thanks guys, thanks for the session. Thanks also to, not only to Zeiss, but also to our other sponsors. First and foremost, B&H, who also supplied all the equipment that we use here for the live show, or for the recording of this show. Um, also thanks to Vitek Videocom and Tools On Air, and see you in the next um, episode of On The Couch. Thank you.